I'm reading uh, a, a bit out of Song of the Snake by Eric Worrell. Eric Worrell was the founder of the Australian Reptile Park that um, is still going today. Uh, one of the main things that the Australian Reptile Park does is that they provide venom for anti-venom manufacturer to the Cornwall Syrup Laboratories. Um, this book, Song of the Snake, is a fantastic read for anyone who is sort of interested in history of Australian herpetology. Um, it's a series of uh, various accounts of, of Eric's life um, as told by Eric. Uh, so the chapter I'm reading is called The Barking Rilla. Um, and so we'll get started. Chapter 15, The Barking Brilla. You've never seen tiger snakes like the ones on Chapel Island. They're as long as a man, their heads are bigger than matchboxes, and they're so black that you can see the sun glisten on their backs a hundred yards away. The speaker was a sandy-haired George Boys, proprietor of the Cabralin Guest House on Flinders Island in Bass Strait. That morning, accompanied by George Cant, curator of Taronga Zoo's reptiles, I had flown from Melbourne to collect a series of snakes from the Ferno Group. Boyles had arranged to hire a fishing boat to take us to Chapel Island, which was only 15 miles from our departure point. Blue rocks on Flinders Island. However, typical Bass Strait weather set in, so we resigned ourselves for a few days at the guest house. From the living room window, we could see the mist-shrouded peak of Mount Chapel on Chapel Island across the foamed whitened sea. The islands of the Ferno Group, northwest of Tasmania, are better known as breeding grounds for mutton birds. Chapel Island is a sanctuary except in March and April when it is open to mutton birders who go to catch the young birds for the canning industry. I used to bird on Chapel up to 28 when I was a youngster, continued George Boys, but I wouldn't have, wouldn't have it on again, and there's a lot like me, too many snakes. What happens if you get bitten? Well, you haven't got much chance. It's only pure luck if the weather's good enough to put a boat out there to get you back from the Flinders. And by that time, the doc's got you. All he can do is sign the certificate. About 42, a mate of mine, Arthur King, was burdened on chapel. Me and my brothers only sold him in the shed a few years before. He put his hand down a burrow after a bird and he felt a nip. He just thought it was the sharp beak of a mutton bird. He walked away, felt a bit dizzy, then realised he'd been bitten by a snake. He fumbled for his pocket knife, but he was in such a daze he dropped it in the tussock grass and couldn't find it. He bit the piece out of his hand and bit his lip pretty badly at the same time. By the time they got him back to Flinders Island and put him to bed in the pub at Whitemark where the doctor treated him, he lingered on for five days before he died. I helped him lay in the box. You could see his bottom lip all bruised and puffed from the bazook from the poison then there was young jimmy murray he was only about 18 and used to take the snakes around the side shows in tassie about 1930 he came in and got my brother to take him over to chapel in the boat that we now use for tripping guests he got about 200 snakes and took them back to stanley in tasmania he was showing them to a crowd and some Smart Alec turned around. They got their fangs out. Poor Jimmy was soon enough to uh, to let one bite him and show that they were still poisonous. They had their fangs all right, and Jimmy died in hospital. That was just before the serum laboratories got their antivenine ready. Jack Maynard was luckier. He went over to chapel with Jimmy Murray, but got his bite sometime later when they had the serum ready. He got over it. Morton Maynard wasn't so lucky. He got a bite on chapel when he was working for us. We brought him back by boat, but he died soon after when we landed on Flinders. We've had a death here on Flinders from a tiger. It was a, a kitty on Vanistar that was killed too. Of course, you won't find a quarter of the snakes on Chapel that were there in those days. They've been thinned out by the birders. In burden season, they used to station a police officer at both ends of the island who would give a sixpence bounty to any tails of snakes that were brought in. A mate of mine got over 260 tails once, snakes and lizards mixed. He couldn't tell the difference with two inches of tail all dried up. He took them to the policeman on one end of the island and collected the bounty. He was told to toss them in the sea. But he took them to John on the other end of the island and collected the bounty again. 
You'll find plenty of snakes on Chapel Island with their tails missing. Old Billy Samuels, an ex-pug from Queensland, used to go around with a shovel chopping the ends off snakes' tails and letting them go again. He had the idea that he thought they could grow another tail. He must have got hundreds. Billy was another one. He was bitten on Chapel a few years back um, and got, but, but got back to... He was bitten on Chapel but got back to Flinders in time for treatment. You'll two be the first one to get in your life since Jimmy Murray. Joyce Vane and Rocky Vane's missus started off with my brother on for Chapel Island only a few years back, but a stiff nor'easter blew up and Joyce had to turn back when they were halfway across. The weather showed no signs of improvement over the next two days, so George and I were housebound. On the third day, George boys drove us up to Roy Goss's farm at Blue Rocks. Roy Goss was a mutton birder and a crayfish fisherman. He'd agreed to take us to chapel if the wind dropped sufficiently. Roy was the only birder working Chapel Isle, and he gave us permission to camp in one of the huts that he directed on chapel for the birding season. On the following day, the weather cleared a little, and the 24-foot cray boat was launched. The seas were far from abated, and the crossing took three and a half hours. Our eyes were glued to Mount Chapel, slowly looming darker on the horizon. George Cann had waited over 20 years for this opportunity. For a number of years, we had planned to make the trip together. Chapel Island is a granite outcrop with shallow topsoil bound with brilla and other low vegetation. There are no trees. The cutter anchored 50 yards offshore and Roy rowed across with our gear. The great masses of granite boulders prevented boat mooring directly on the island. Birding huts were strongly built with paling walls, concrete foundations and earthen floors. The tank contained the only water on the island. Roy showed us around before the island before leaving. We obtained a special permit from the Tasmanian Animals and Birds Protection Board to visit the rookery and correct, correct snakes for research. The only condition was that we took no guns, shovels or interfered with the nesting mutton birds. The entire island is honeycombed with mutton bird burrows and George and I seemed to spend much time on our faces on our feet. The snake hunters usually find it necessary to fix their eye on points about 50 feet ahead in order to see the snakes before they wriggle away. He found that if we kept our eyes no more than a yard ahead, we would step into burrows. At times, the undergrowth was so thick we'd have to walk across the top. Frequently, the ears would collapse and we would plunge through to our waists. We'd walk several hundred yards apart at first, could not understand why the, what caused the querulous growling sound beneath our feet. Roy explained that the sounds were burrowing mutton birds preparing for the burrow for laying, and most of the birds were at sea, dredging up plankton, but a number stayed in their burrows during the day. The first snake was a smallish three-footer. It darted from a clump of brilla between our legs and was smartly snapped up by George. Later, Roy grabbed another one by the tail and held it until George arrived with the bag. I climbed to the top of Mount Chapel. The mount was heavily grassed with tussocks, scrubbing your patches and huge yellow lichen-coloured boulders embedded in the side. On one steep pinch I felt I was feeling above my head for a handhold when I almost put my hand on a cake of cow dung. I grabbed the tussock instead and hauled myself out when it only recalled to me that there was no cattle on the island and only a few sheep grazing from Roy's leases. Sure enough, as my face drew level, the cow dung changed to a fine black tiger snake. Leisurely it uncoiled its glistening sixth, sixth feet, casually flicked its tongue and slowly crawled past my shoulder. As the tail came past, I gently took hold and lifted it from the rock and dropped it unprotesting into the canvas sack. It was one of the easiest captures I had ever made. We met back at the hut where Roy had left us with the understanding that if we were bitten or struck or any other trouble, we would set smoke from the top of the mountain. Plenty of smoke in the daylight, plenty of flame at night, he said. It'll bring the bait back, back even if there was a cyclone blower. That night, while there was still a little light in the sky, the mutton birds came in. George and I sat on a rock outside of the hut watching the aerial acrobatics as they swooped and glided in their thousands, one by one dropping into their nesting burrows. After dark, they sat outside their burrows, allowing us to touch them with the torchlight. They're larger than pigeons, with a brown, satiny plumage. 
They squabbled and growled it as they energetically scooped out their burrows with their webbed feet, sending earth flying for several yards. In November each year, the birds flock to their burrows, and each nesting female lays a single egg. At the end of March, about half a million young are taken by birders and salted in casks. Some birders get up to seven pounds, ten shillings per hundred. Despite this toll, the mutton birds come back every year and nest again in the same burrows. Just before dawn, the cries of the mutton birds increased to a vibrating roar. There was a rush of wind with thousands upon thousands rapidly beating their wings and the birds taking off to the fishing grounds. By daylight, not a single mutton bird was to be seen. That day, George and I covered the entire island. Handsome Cape Barren geese were so tame that you were able to stroke several. At times, they were a nuisance ambling among the tracks just ahead of enough of us to scare the snakes undercover. It was hard work, struggling knee-deep in brilla, our legs smarted from nettles that stung through our pants. By the next morning, we caught about 70. The largest were over six feet long, and strangely enough, the small ones were agile enough to elude us down the mutton bird burrows. The old ones were sluggish and quite easily caught. The most puzzling feature at first is how these giant snakes existed on a waterless and apparently foodless island. However, after some careful observations on the snakes and their natural state, examining their excrement and experiments with our captives, we were able to establish a number of their remarkable feeding habits. They obtained water by sucking on the condensed mist of leaves and grass. The young fed on three species of small skink. Uh, the adult snakes feeding on young Burton birds for about two months of the year, accumulating enough body fat in their body to exist for the remainder of the year on a light diet of fish stranded in rock pools, carrion, occasional birds, rats and mice. Norwegian rats could completely rife out the rookery under favourable conditions, but their absence could be explained by the presence of black tiger snakes. The mutton birds, like the black tiger snakes, eat uh, a small recompense for their control of the rat population. Indiscriminate feeding habits were as demonstrated by the specimens brought back to the Ocean Beach Aquarium. The Ocean Beach Aquarium was the name of the Australian Reptile Park before it became the Australian Reptile Park. Just a little side note. The first meal was mutton chop, but on the menu now consists of strips of steak, liver, mice, fish and frogs. In a short time they would take a dead rat or a mouse from my hands. We only spent a few days on Chapel Island, however I'd made up my mind to return the following birding season. I wanted to see the industry at work. On the Bass Strait Islands, the passage of time is marked by the burden seasons. At the end of September, without fail, millions of these migratory mutton birds fly from the Bering Strait to these desolate islands, reconditioning their old nesting burrows. By March, the fledglings are rolling in fat and covered with a fluffy down. The chicks are bigger than their parents. By about the 10th of March, the Bass Strait Islanders load their boats with supplies and with their entire families sail to the Stormy Strait to the rookeries. The young birds are taken from their burrows, killed, dressed and pickled in casks, the Tasmanian and New Zealand canning markets, some to find their way to delicatessens, but most are canned and sold to squab in aspic. Eric West, my Murray Miverite mate, returned with me to Flinders Island in the 1955 birding season. We sailed with Roy Goss, his wife and two daughters, Ruth and Marie, and once more to Chapel Island. As helpers, Roy took Mark West and his family from White Mark, the Wests and the Cape Barren Islanders. It was a stormy crossing with the two families straddling their gear in tiny boat. Royal bailed continuously as each wave burst onto the deck, drenching the bedding and supplies. Samuel Plimsoll must have turned over in his grave. On that first day ashore on Chapel Island, we helped clean out the sheds, organised equipment to process the birds. At dawn the next day, Eric and I followed Roy and Mark out to the rookery. Roy and Mark carried long pointed sticks called spits, these spits were thrust into the ground near the birds, and if the birds and the birds were pulled from their burrows, their necks cracked, and they were threaded on the spits in their fifties. The full spit, weighing over a hundred pounds, was carried back to the sheds by each birder in turn. In the field, the birds seemed to me to be playing Russian roulette, a Tasmanian version at least, where they laid on their backs in the dense brilla bushes, shoving their arms into burrows, heaving and grunting and straining as they strove for birds barely that their fingers could touch. 
There is no doubt that many of the boroughs contained tiger snakes, and it was seemed only a matter of a time before someone would be bitten. The mutton birders, as they call the brilla clumps on the island, on Chapel Island, the barking brilla. As the sun warms the rookery, the black tiger snakes crawl from their burrows and bask on the sand outside. If they are disturbed, they give out a barking cock. We worked out ahead of the birders, grabbing the snakes by the tails as they tried to slide back in. We missed a number and we saw birders thrust their arms into these burrows and pull out birds. Chapel Island has evolved a relatively docile race of tiger snakes, but and this fact favours the birders and the snake coils up behind the bird when disturbed and thus shielded from the probing hand by the plump chick. Nevertheless, I was never able to put myself into a hand into a burrow. When we saw snakes go into short burrows, we would probe behind the chick with the length of fencing wire and hook out the tiger. Tiger snakes normally inoffensive would be stirred up from the probing wire and come out fighting. It was tricky trying to grab the striking snake by the tail when he was intent on biting ankles. The thick brilla and nettles made the job more awkward and, as often as not, dodging our feet would plunge into the earth into undetermined by burrows, undermined by burrows. The horrible thought that we would be standing on a nest of tiger snakes would rocket back to us, rocket us back out of these caved in burrows. By the end of the week, we had had over a hundred large tiger snakes, and the accommodation was getting scarce. Eric helped in the opening room, and I salted down birds while we waited for an opportunity to get back to Flinders Island. When the birders bought in a spit, they would squeeze the crop and the stomachs into a drum. A rich orange coloured oil would be skimmed from this gurry. This was stowed in five dollars uh, in drums and bought at five pound a gallon. These squeezed birds were tossed through a trap into, a, into the pluck house, where most of the feathers were stripped off the birds by the girls. Ten-year-old Daryl West chopped off the legs of the, and the still warm birds were pushed through another trap into the scolding room where Mrs. Goss and Mr. West scalded them and plucked off the rest of the remaining few feathers. The birds were sacked like rows in white, white, white puddings on cooling racks until the flesh had set later that day. When the racks were full, the birders came in. Both families converged on the opening room where the birds were split cleaned, salted and packed in casks of brine. That day, a day that started before dawn, often finished about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night. It's customary for schools on Flinders Island to close for a month during the birding season to allow children to follow their parents to the rookeries. The Christmas holiday is shortened to a fortnight to compensate for this. However, as few families now sailing to birding islands, the education authorities are moving to cancel birding holidays. The three schoolgirls of children, Mark and Roy, were expert shed workers. 15-year-old Marie Goss had her first come to Chapel Island when she was only a week old. She had learned to walk for the following season on Chapel Island and has accompanied her parents to the island every year since. When the Goss family first birded the chapel, it was supported the largest number of sheds in the Ferno group, but now the Goss family were the only ones prepared to risk the tiger snakes. The girls put us through the usual pranks like sewing up the sleeves of our clothes. Eric and I were camped in a tent, only a hundred yards from the same sheds amongst the brilla. We woke one night clutching our stomachs. It's the girls, Eric said hoarsely. Their job just for hanging those sheep's dead eyes in their doorway. We spent most of the night driving, diving out in the drizzling rain and back again. However, the next morning, we general roll up of our strained faces at the breakfast table told us on a story. We had a dose of tomaine poisoning. After an afternoon, I salted down the boys when I heard a sound outside the shed. I pushed open the door and Roy Goss was standing white-faced outside. He held up his arm, blood dribbled from the wrist. There was a crude rope taut and K above his elbow, a snake bite. Mrs. Goss peered through the fly screen window at the scalding shed and began to weep. Arthur King, who'd been watching, who she had watched dying from a Chapel Island tiger snake bite in the White Mark Hotel, was her uncle. Eric ran into the tent for the tiger snake, Andy Benin. I saw Roy on a bag of mutton birds 
I sat Roy on a bag of mutton bird feathers, and while Mrs. Goss brought the kettle to the boil, I placed the rope tourniquet with a more efficient probe line. I opened the incisions that Roy had made until Severin turned into a bed. We had to be severe. His life was at stake, and there was no other medical help that could be obtained. There was no wireless or any other form of communication on the island. The boat could not be launched with the heavy sea that was running. Roy was sweating with the pain of the constricting tourniquet. His face was deathly pale under the burrowing grime. I came, Eric came back with ampoules of serum and a syringe. Sterilising the syringe, we assembled the syringe, breaking the tops of the serum ampoules and drawing the serum through the needle seemed to take ages. Locating a vein was not difficult. Roy's arm bulged with them. His skin was like rhinoceros hide and the needle bowed every time I, it pierced the skin and slid into a vein. Allowing us time for the serum to circulate, I released the tourniquet and made him sit quietly in front of the kitchen fire with strict orders to keep quiet for the rest of the day. An hour later, his, serum, his colour had returned to normal. I checked his pulse and general reflexes and asked how he felt. Bonza, he growled. Bring me that snake and I'll fucking eat him. He told us how he came to be bitten. He found a good patch of birds and caught 20 in a few feet of each other. He had threaded most of them on the spit by the lower beak and continued catching. The normal procedure was to catch a dozen or so birds, holding them by the necks, then spit them. He had a few birds in one hand and lay on the ground, thrusting his arm into the burrow after another bird. He could just touch the chick, so he decided to give himself greater reach. He pushed hard with his feet and threw his hand containing the birds into the tussock behind the burrow. There was a snake underneath the tussock. He grabbed, grabbed, by, it grabbed him by the wrist. Roy dropped the birds and reached for the pocket lance. He jabbed at the punctures and tied his rope tourniquet. His eyesight started to blur and he felt dizzy. He made his way straight back to camp. Only 10 minutes had elapsed from the time he was bitten to the time he was injected with anvenom. The next day, Roy was in good spirits, began birding at dawn with Mark. I warned him to be particularly careful as I only had one ample of serum left and it would be a toss-up whether it would be sufficient enough to treat a bite. Everyone was uneasy that day and the men seemed overdue with one of the women would climb high on a rock and actually scan the island for a sign of them. When they came in for smoke, O'Roy chuckled, you should have seen Mark that morning. He was stepping so high, he looked like a ballet dancer, making sure that he wouldn't plant a foot on a Joe Blake. After smoke, Eric and I decided to climb to the top of Mount Chapel and see again if we could come across any really big tiger snakes. We heard stories of eight footers killed by birders, but our biggest was just over six feet. Of course, this is still a lot of a snake considering half the mainland tiger snakes out there are a large at a yard and a half. High on the mountain we could see Roy Gus below, churning through the brilla to get at burrows. We once saw him grab a tiger snake by the tail, stand on its head and rip it off. We caught a couple of largest ones on the mountain and then made our way back to the shed just behind the living quarters. Eric suddenly grabbed my arm and pointed to a black tail vanishing down a burrow. Leave it, I said, it's hardly worth the trouble getting out. It's nearly six feet, insisted Eric. I saw more of it than you did. It'll be worth having. I hooked the wire into the burrow and a young button bird came squealing out, so I popped that into a burrow alongside and probed for the snake. As the barking was amplified by the burrow, we kept probing and heard the rasp of scales the snake made for the entrance as it slid out, angrily flattening. It made a couple of strikes and then I grabbed it as it turned into the tussocks. As Eric opened the bag, I slipped into the thrashing snake and tied the knot. Suddenly Eric gasped, dropped the bag and clutched his hand. It bit me through the bag. His face was comically incredulous. I thought he was joking until I saw the blood welling from a puncture at the base of his left index finger. I whipped out the rubber tourniquet around his arm, tore the wrapper off a new razor blade with my teeth I sliced a V out of the flesh and completely removed the puncture mark area. With the small amount of serum we had left in the first aid kit, this could be the only deciding factor. We only had 100 yards to go to camp, so I sucked out the blood from Eric's hand as we slowly picked our way through the mutton bird burrows. One of the boarders was squeezing Gary from the spit of the birds 
when he slowly came down the tar. Eric, with his hand in my mouth, Mrs. Goss took the position at a glance and rushed to boil the kettle. Eric sat on a soapbox in the kitchen. He looked terribly. His face was colourless. He was soaked in sweat. I could barely, he could barely sit up and he was weak till he complained of hazy vision and a dry mouth. His arm had turned black. I snapped the top on the last ampule of serum and filled the syringe. I injected the serum into his arm and I slowly released the tourniquet, minimising the pain of the returning circulation. He began to tremble with cold, so Mrs. Goss rubbed him up and stretched out the grass floor in front of the fire. The beer carton, padded with a cushion, was propped up under his head. Eric was bitten at 10.40am and by 6pm he looked a little better, although his pulse was still erratic. The boat was aground and couldn't be launched until the morning tide. I was worried without, about not having insufficient serum. He was listless, dozing on and off, and his hand was swelling and he developed ugly black blotches. It worries me to see him like this, whispered Mrs Goss. He seems to be throwing in the, spon throwing in the sponge. Too much like Uncle Arthur. We'll have to try and cheer him up to see if he can pull himself together. For the next hour we cracked jokes, but all they did was make him sick. After a bout of retching, his condition seemed better, and he was able to walk back to the tent for the night. After, we, after he had gone, we discussed his condition and decided that if there was no improvement by the morning tide, the boat would be launched regardless of the weather. We suddenly noticed the girls were missing, and then we found that we had to have another cheer-up session. They were lying in their beds weeping, convinced Eric was going to die. That night, I slept beside Eric, and every night I fell asleep, I would start up again suddenly, lean over to see if he was still alive. He seemed to improve by the morning, except for the painfully swollen hand. His pulse had only slightly below normal, and he felt quite well when he stood up. Then his temperature climbed, his pulse accelerated, and he began to vomit again. It's not worth the risk, I said, Roy. He launched the boat and we loaded Eric and our catch of snakes aboard and headed for Whitemark Hospital on Flinders Island. Eric fully recovered from the bite. He is one of few men to do so. He is unlikely for, to forget his experience. It's the end of the chapter. There's a couple of photos. I'll just show you those as well. That's Eric on Chapel Island with one of those six foot slugs. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.